Thank you for attending our first event. I'm sorry, our second event in the 2021 Sentencing Workshop Series titled Vetting Wrongful Convictions, Perspective, Approach, and Strategy, hosted by the National Association of Sentencing Commissions and the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Before we begin, we just have a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the event today, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click on the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video participants. Second, we wanna draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. Third, please note that auto-generated transcription has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the automated transcription or to hide it, click live transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available on the event page and social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Follow us at OSU Law DEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the event. John? Uh, thanks, Ali. Uh, Judge Zamuda, do you want to kick us off, or would you like me to, to, to do the intros? I think you can do the intros. Okay. Um, well, my name is John Hallway. I'm the Executive Director of the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to share the virtual stage with uh, Judge Zamuda and with three really fabulous uh, advocates in the field of conviction integrity units. Um, Conviction integrity units are, uh, uh, I think they've officially become a thing, right? Like in, in, in 2005 or so, when San Diego and Dallas now fight for the title of who started the first one, uh, it was sort of unclear what a conviction integrity unit was going to become. And the idea of uh, a unit within a, a prosecutor's office that was dedicated to the investigation of uh, colorable claims of actual innocence often outside a structured appellate system was a pretty novel one and one, frankly, that uh, generated a lot of skepticism from uh, both internally at prosecutor's offices and externally. Um, when we published our report in 2016 on a national perspective uh, of conviction review units or conviction integrity units, uh, there had gone, we'd gone from that one or two in the mid 2000s to about 25 and we interviewed 21 of them to try to come up with uh, some sort of national sense of, of best practices, ways to respond to the skepticism that was out there and to give communities ways to differentiate uh, good units, sincere units that were, that were doing this, I think in good faith from units that were kind of created uh, to, mostly for, for public relations and, and sort of you know, validating some concerns in their jurisdictions that uh, perhaps it was the fox guarding the hen house. Um, and so at the time, we interviewed 21 of the first 25 units. They were almost exclusively in large metropolitan areas uh, and you know, raised in addition to the sort of overarching questions of, are you for real, raised a lot of really interesting procedural and legal questions, uh, some of which were jurisdictionally specific. So you know, even if a unit or prosecutors wanted to withdraw a conviction that had been confirmed, uh, do prosecutors have the power in that jurisdiction? Um, how do we manage actual innocence in a jurisdiction that doesn't have a, a colorable claim for that in your appellate law? Um, should petitioners in the, in the process have to toll appeals in, in post-conviction appeals, or should they have to waive their Fifth Amendment rights in order to access the, the unit? Um, how would the unit and defense attorneys interact in investigating these claims? Would it accept claims of innocence resolved by plea bargains? And each of these things has been done sort of on an ad hoc basis as units get started, given the, the um, uh, fractured nature of our criminal justice system. So we tried to provide some of those answers in 2016 when there were 25. Um, now we're aware of more than 90. So in the past five years, this has really as a concept exploded and taken hold in jurisdictions across the country, including, uh, Judge Zamuda, correct if I'm wrong, but there you know, are two in Ohio and a, and a third that has been announced uh, in Columbus, as I understand it. Yes. Um, and, and what was exclusively a large kind of metropolitan structure has expanded now to smaller jurisdictions, sometimes smaller counties sharing a unit, uh, and sometimes even statewide units are now uh, becoming increasingly uh, uh, something that we're seeing and raise, those raise new questions about jurisdiction and other issues. Uh, and some are taking on uh, issues beyond actual innocence, looking at sentencing policy, uh, police misconduct, 
uh, and other potential um, uh, injustice issues. So there's a lot going on in this space that's worthy of conversation and evaluation. Um, I'm gonna let each of our panelists uh, introduce themselves in more detail and talk about um, their units, but just real briefly, I think we'd be hard pressed to find anywhere in the country a better panel than the three women that are here to talk about how units are emerging, how structural differences might impact what you're able to do, and how important this work is in general. Um, in, in no real particular order, I guess I guess it's alphabetic if I'm going by Strasier as opposed to Lazari, uh, but, uh, but we'll start with Valerie Newman, who has been the head of Wayne County's Conviction Integrity Unit since 2017. Um, Wayne County's CIU has been in the news quite a bit lately because they just keep exonerating people and uh, lots of really interesting cases. Um, the thing that has really struck me about the, the Wayne County unit is just how long most of their exonerees have spent in prison, the kind of length of those sentences. And we'll look forward to having Valerie talk about that. Um, Lindsay Smith has been working with the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission, a state agency created by statute in North Carolina in 2007, since 2010, and she's been its executive director since 2015, um, running an organization that has reviewed almost 3,000 petitions for inno innocence uh, and running them through a, a, a pretty unique process. So, uh, Lindsay, thanks for being here, and we'll look forward to hearing you <clears throat> talk about that. Um, and then more recently, uh, Lisa Lazari Strasier was tapped to lead Pennsylvania's statewide unit in February 2020, a really terrific time to start a new project uh, just right in front of COVID. I'm sure that was a real joy. Um, and, and so how to merge local or county-driven conviction integrity units within a statewide attorney general context uh, to make sure that people in other jurisdictions also receive this important uh, service. So tremendous experience around the table, lots of different perspectives. And I thought maybe we'd just kind of go around the Zoom square, uh, sort of in the order of, of introductions and have each of you talk about sort of, you know, your role, the scope of your mission, your jurisdiction, uh, and how that might help or, or, or limit what you're able to do in conviction integrity work. So Valerie, why don't we start with you? Thank you, John. Thank you, Judge Muda, for having us. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. And I am, as John said, uh, Valerie Newman, the director of the Conviction Integrity Unit for the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. So we are a large metropolitan area. We have a population in Wayne County of around a little over 1.7 million. And we are the second most populous um, county in the state. So we have a lot of, um, and we also have a lot of um, criminal cases in this county. So I think our county uh, tries approximately 50% of the serious criminal cases for the entire state of Michigan. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, the unit, I was hired in 2017 to start this unit. So we were a new unit. I was brought in to develop all the procedures um, and get things up and running. Uh, to date, we have received about 1,800 requests for review uh, in the little over three years that we've been up and running. And I'm really pleased to say that as of yesterday, we have granted relief to 30 individuals in a little over three years. Um, our work has, uh, our jurisdiction is quite large, which I think accounts for one of the reasons why we have such a large number of people applying to the unit. So when we set up how we were going to run our unit, we decided, uh, you know, I in talks with the prosecutor, of course, I, I don't make any um, decision making. It, it all lies uh, with the elected prosecutor. But in conjunction with her, we talked about what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And we came down on the side of innocence is innocence. So even though if it was going to create a backlog, we didn't want to put any uh, limitations on who could apply to the unit. So our uh, unit will accept applications from people who have pled guilty. Our unit will accept applications from people who were convicted of misdemeanors. Our unit will accept applications for people who never even served time in prison. Uh, with the recognition that people who are in prison are always gonna be the priority because their liberty has been, they've been deprived of their liberty and that's always gonna be the priority uh, where we spend our time but that there are other consequences attendant with a criminal conviction. For example, I've had multiple cases where people were subjected to deportation. So even though they were not in prison, 
uh, they were still going to be deprived of their liberty and ability to stay in the United States if this wrongful conviction or the, it, you know, if they were factually innocent, and we could prove it, they became a priority. Otherwise, they were going to be deported. So there's um, a variety of ways that we develop our priorities. Um, but certainly people who are at loss of liberty is, is number one. And then the other thing I think that's un maybe not unique, but forward thinking about our unit is that we will both exonerate people. So if we can find evidence that supports factual innocence, that's an exoneration. But we also recognize in many cases, and especially as John said, we've had some cases where people have served um, decades behind bars, you can't always locate the evidence to be able to, um, or be able to reinvestigate to prove someone's innocence. So if we find uh, that there were problems that undermine the integrity of the conviction, even if we can't fully support factual innocence, this, uh, my prosecutor, prosecutor worthy, is still willing to grant relief. So if you look at the cases, the 30 cases so far, approximately half of them we call exonerations, meaning we feel comfortable saying we can show factual innocence. And the other half are cases where we say we have dismissed the case, granted a new trial, but we have not retried anybody. So those cases were dismissed without prejudice. And we have had two cases where people entered guilty pleas. So in one, we did, we, we did an investigation and the individual was, we found, uh, was wrongfully convicted of first degree murder, but he had played some role. And so he accepted a guilty plea to accessory after the fact. And in another case recently, we had someone who pled guilty to second degree murder. So we work very hard to achieve justice, I guess is the broadest way that I can put it. And so if we see an injustice, we uh, look for a way that within the bounds of what's available to us here in Michigan uh, to rectify that issue. Thanks, Valerie. Uh, Lindsay, you want to go next? Sure. Thank you all for having me today. Um, as John said, I'm Lindsay Guy Smith. I'm the executive director of the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. And we are a little bit different, I think, than um, any of the other conviction integrity groups out there in that we are um, an independent state agency that is charged with the neutral investigation and evaluation of post conviction claims of innocence. We are actually set up um, as an independent agency. We're housed under our administrative office of the courts, which is our judicial branch, uh, but that is just for administrative purposes only. So things like finance and HR, um, things like that. But for our everyday work, we are independent. Um, we have been given all of the tools of both criminal and civil procedure in order to effectuate our investigations. So that means we can do a lot of things that other folks can't do. Um, one example is we can subpoena someone for a civil deposition to put them under oath and ask them questions. On the flip side of that, we can also seek a material witness order under criminal procedure. We can get a search warrant if we need to go and search for evidence or um, if someone, for example, has told us that they have something uh, but they won't provide it or produce it, and we have probable cause, we meet that uh, statutory requirement for a search warrant, and we can go get one of those. Um, we also are able to collect all files that have been preserved by the state, whether that's the prosecutor's office, law enforcement, or the clerk's office, and we're also able to collect all physical evidence that remains. That includes uh, seeking uh, to search for evidence if there is information that it may still exist. We've actually had 28 cases where someone has said the evidence does not exist, but we've been able to go in and either ask them to search again or conduct a search ourselves and have found that evidence. And in multiple cases, uh, those cases where we've located and then subjected that evidence to DNA or other forensic testing has resulted in exonerations. We also have the ability, once we locate the evidence, to collect it. We have our own evidence room and our own evidence custodians. I'm one of those. Um, and we bring it back to our office where we store it pursuant to all of the same guidelines <coughs> law enforcement and clerks are required to store evidence under. Um, 
And then we can subject that to DNA and other forensic testing. And that includes up to and including consumption of biological material where doing so is necessary to our investigation. We're a little different um, because we are kind of this independent and neutral body. We never represent the convicted person in any way. Uh, we are not advocates for them in any way. And we're simply there to seek truth, whatever the truth may be. A lot of times that can result in a confirmation of guilt. Other times that leads to a hearing um, where we are presenting all relevant materials and information to our commissioners to determine whether a case should move back into the court process for additional review. Our process is also completely outside of the appeals process, so that's a little different as well. Um, our cases are um, handled outside of that process. The basics are someone applies to the commission or has their case referred to us. We internally uh, have staff that investigates and evaluates those claims. If there appears to be some evidence of innocence that is new and credible or verifiable, then that case is presented to the commissioners, and there are eight of them, and a hearing. Uh, at that hearing, the defendant isn't responsible or convicted person isn't responsible for any burden at that hearing. That is simply a hearing that is non-adversarial where I present the case to our commissioners and they say there is sufficient evidence of factual innocence to merit judicial review or there is not. And if they move the case forward, then it goes back to a three judge panel process, which is an adversarial process and where the convicted person then has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that he or she is innocent of the crimes. A couple of other quick things. Um, we are limited to look at only felonies uh, for convictions in North Carolina state court. So we can't look at misdemeanors. We also cannot look at any claims outside of North Carolina or in the federal jurisdiction. And I apologize if you all hear a weed eater in the background. I'm actually on vacation right now and I can't control what's happening outside the window. Uh, the other uh, key hallmark um, of the statute is that individuals must be claiming complete factual innocence for the crime they've been convicted of or for any reduced level of responsibility. So they can't say, hey, I was just the getaway driver. We are just not able to look at those cases. And then there must be new evidence of innocence that wasn't heard at trial or that wasn't um, reasonably available at the time of the guilty plea. So we can look at plea cases and cases that resulted in conviction after trial. I said that our commissioners um, are eight individuals. Those are statutorily uh, laid out and they are intended to represent a full array of individuals from the criminal justice system and beyond. So they include a superior court judge, a district attorney, a defense attorney, a sheriff, a victim advocate, a member of the public who is not an attorney, and then two discretionary members. And those folks are all chosen by the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court here in North Carolina or the <clears throat> Chief Justice of the Court of Appeals in North Carolina. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. And for what it's worth, uh, A, a lot of us love to talk about conviction integrity and it's while, our, while we're on vacation. Uh, but B, your, 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 weed, your weed whacker is not uh, audible, so you were doing great. No, no, no interference there. Um, Lisa, why don't we turn to you? I mean, a, a statewide model, but I suspect we're going to hear some pretty substantial differences from what Lindsay just laid out. Um, the, my, I'm Lisa Lazari Strazier. I am the Chief Deputy of the Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General Conviction Integrity Section. Uh, we launched in February of 20. 20, uh, launched in a very strange uh, and moving environment. So I went from the office for two, literally two days to my home where I still am working out of. So we, we are in, let's say the development stage, but I will say this, as I listened to Lindsay, I thought we were so different as far as how we operate, but very much of our criteria is exactly the same. Felony, we, we are still, um, you must be incarcerated on the conviction in question. 
a, a complete claim of innocence. And the only, um, we're statewide. So we have 67 counties in Pennsylvania. The Philadelphia has its own operating unit. So those, that is the only jurisdiction that our state agency would not look at. As far as criteria, we're very much the same. Now, do we intend to stay that way? I think we call it keeping the funnel narrow so that we're not overwhelmed and we can address those persons that are possibly innocent still serving a sentence. And do I see uh, the unit changing and developing so that we would open up the criteria to say, even if you are no longer serving the sentence or a misdemeanor because of collateral consequences, we may do that down the road, but we do, that is not uh, how we accept cases. The difference between Lindsay and I and Valerie as a state agency, I accept applications and of the over 600 that I have since last year, 1% have come from defense attorneys. So they are pro se applicants. They are the inmates serving the sentences. We have our applications either available online at our website. The majority of those I send out after a letter from an inmate and um, once received, I vet them until I get to the point where I would go to the local prosecutor. And that's where we differ. In Pennsylvania, the uh, attorney general's office has limited jurisdiction and it's dictated by statute. Mm -hmm. So my heavy lift over the last 18 months has been creating an atmosphere of trust and collaboration with the local prosecutor's office. Because if they don't refer the case to us, if it wasn't a case that we prosecuted originally, we have to get that referral from that DA. So my work essentially is to develop uh, a review that would indicate to the local prosecutor something went wrong and we should look at it. And if you have the resources, you can do yourself, but the majority of Pennsylvania counties uh, don't have the resources. So that's where our office came into play. And um, we're moving forward at a very quick pace as far as what the culture has become over the last year. And if you think about it, folks, uh, everything that has happened in the last 12 months has put our our mission at the forefront, criminal justice reform, uh, prison uh, reform, sentencing reform, indigent representation reform, post-conviction statutory reform. Uh, so this is critical and being able to look at different jurisdictions and different ways that we address wrongful convictions is, is critical work and important work. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> it's uh, actually kind of the point for you to be on your soapbox, soapbox here. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to say for everybody in the audience that the, the Q&A area is open. I actually have it open on my screen so we can field questions as they come in and would encourage anybody, uh, any, of the, any of the observers to throw questions into that so that we can make this as uh, rewarding for, for you all watching as we possibly can. Um, so one of the interesting challenges that I think each of the three of you are reflecting in different ways is um, how to convey the kind of sincerity and good faith of this as a kind of higher order mission, right? The mission of the ongoing mission of doing justice and being accurate and getting it right uh, as a perpetual obligation of a of a prosecutor, and and you know we 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 see units that struggle with this in a couple of different areas. One is with the defense bar, where the adversarial relationships you know can can create that that skepticism, and where there is I think a risk of the perception uh, that an office isn't going to investigate its own cases, right? So Lindsay doesn't have that, and Lisa maybe less, but but Valerie, I'm sure you've had that. Then there's the, the internal pushback from either prosecutors who have had those cases and would never be part of, of a case, you know, where something has gone wrong, and, and that's you know it can be a challenge there. Um, 
uh, or other officer or, or other other people in the office who just feel like now they've got a new watchdog. So I and 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 Lindsay, even though you're an independent agency, you're still trying to get information and things. So let me ask each of you, and I'll just kind of throw this open, and, and we can have a conversation because that's more fun. Um, what you do to convey and and build that trust? How do you convince skeptics? that this is for real? And what do you have to do to deliver on that promise? Well, I guess I'll start since uh, I have to deal with this on a daily basis. So I would say it's really tough. Uh, when I came into this office, I was a defense attorney with over 20 years experience. I had never been a prosecutor. I'd never prosecuted a case, never worked in a prosecutor's office in any capacity. And so I came in here with a reputation of, I, I hope, of integrity and someone who could be trusted, but yet someone who was always an adversary to the people that were in this office. And I specialized in appellate work. And so I was very familiar with the appellate attorneys in the office, but maybe not so much with all the trial attorneys. And I think my reception in this office is, is was, um, pretty much the same as, as all of my colleagues that I've talked to across the country, which is we were not welcomed with open arms. Um, it was a very difficult thing for a lot of people when I'm sure our office, like many office struggles with resources, doesn't get enough money to, you know, doesn't, don't feel like we get enough money to prosecute the cases and do the work well that that needs to be done. And now you're gonna take some resources and you're gonna say, you're gonna go and investigate these old cases. Um, you know, we have, that, that's not really our job as prosecutors. And so it has been a cultural change. I think uh, Lindsay and Lisa both hit on that, that, you know, things change over time. And I would say, you know, I've been here a little over three years. I have seen a very significant cultural shift, I would say among at least a percentage of the prosecutors, you know, people who are glad that I'm here, they come in and they talk to me about ethical issues they have or a legal issue that they have. Um, you know, they don't want to do anything wrong. And so I think that's all a very good positive shift. Um, I'm not going to say, you know, it's the entire office, but you know, uh, progress is progress and uh, you take what you can get sometimes. And then with the defense bar, um, you know, the defense bar, I think for me, I, I feel very fortunate that because I was a defense attorney for so long that people know me, they trust me. And I think they, they approach this that I would try to do the right thing. Now, <clears throat> they might not have had a trust of the entire process because of course I don't control the entire process. I control a piece of it. I don't make decisions, I make recommendations. So we still had to show them that the entire process from start to finish was going to be fair. And I've done that by working with defense attorneys in a very, very collaborative manner. I mean, if they want to sit in on witness interviews, by and large, I allow a defense attorney to sit in on a witness interview. I mean, I will integrate the defense into my case investigation uh, as much pretty much as the defense wants to be integrated into that investigation. I mean, there's going to be times where we can't do it, but they're going to be rare. Uh, when we find documents, I'm going to turn those documents over. And no one has to say, no one has to ask me, hey, Val, do you have this? Or, hey, Val, did you find this? If I find it, I'm going to turn it over. Um, so I think that you, there's a lot of things we can do in a conviction integrity unit to build trust uh, by acting in an open and transparent manner by communicating with people what we're doing, why it's taking so long. I mean, that's the biggest complaint is that it takes too long. Um, and, and how can it take so long when I, as a lawyer, have done all the work for you? I've already interviewed the witnesses. I've given you, I've written it all up for you. I mean, all you have to do is read what I wrote and you should, you know, you should see that my guy is innocent. And, and it's like, as much as I trust you, I may trust you, we still have to do the work ourselves. And guess what? When we do the work ourselves, I will say in almost every case, we have found things the defense attorneys never found. Right. And part of that is access. We have, um, we have greater access as prosecutors than you do as a defense attorney. 
And I have had cases, for example, where I have uncovered federal investigations into the defendant that overlap with when the crime was committed. Now, as a defense attorney, I could never go to the DEA and say, hey, I want to come look at your file. I mean, I could, right? But it, it, it wouldn't happen. But as a prosecutor, I can go to the DEA and say, hey, I'd like to look at your file. And I can go and I can look at a file. So I still can't copy anything, but I can look at it. And um, you know, we that has proved a treasure trove of information in some of these cases that otherwise we wouldn't have had access to and has helped prove people's innocence. So I think those are the, I, I could talk about this for a long time, so I won't, but those are some of the ways where I think, you know, we work really hard to develop trust outside the office and then inside the office. Um, I'm kind of known, I mean, it, some of this stuff is silly and we've talked about it on our CIU things, but um, you know, I bake cookies or brownies and I bring in them and I let people know that they're here. It brings people to your office, you have a casual conversation and I don't become the demonized person, I become the person who brings cookies. Um, you know, just, I, you know, I do what I can to ingratiate myself. Uh, I help out whenever there's a call for volunteers, I always raise my hand for, I'll, I'll do it. I'll volunteer for anything, it doesn't matter what it is. And so I just try to, you know, I try really hard because the CIU is walled off from the rest of the office to show people that I'm here, I'm a, I'm a decent human being, I'm willing to volunteer and help and uh, participate in the office. And so, you know, that's how I try and build relationships um, with folks and, and get them to trust me. And then they see our work and it gives me an opportunity. I, I tell my entire team, every single one of you is an ambassador for this unit. I, when you talk to people, I wanna hear positive things, talk about, you know, talk about how intensive our investigations are you know, kind of what we're doing, that we're not looking to blame or shame anybody. We just want the truth. I mean, really, who can be against truth? I, it, it's really hard to stand up and raise your hand and say, I don't believe in finding the truth. I, you know, so I think if you phrase things in a way that people are just like, yeah, okay, mistakes get made, we're human beings. Something but might that, get overlooked. And- But, uh, but, but Valerie, I, 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 I think that, that seeking the truth is is implicitly not what ultimately happens in many wrongful conviction evaluations which is why there are only 90 CIU units nationwide i mean there are what 2700 counties in this in this nation 90 of which and i think one of the issues is the lack of uh, that the process itself the integrity of the process is not really being examined rather it's the impetus of the person. You happen to work for a, a district attorney who is very much proactive in that truth seeking. There are other prosecutors that are not, right? Because for them, or they think they are, but they act upon it in a different way, all right? So if it's driven because you have, an, you have somebody in the office that says, yes, we must investigate these claims, all right? Um, Justice shouldn't be dependent on the person. It should be dependent on equal application within the process. And one of the things that I do is chairing the task force in Ohio is to try and figure out what's the best way to maintain or improve the integrity of the process so that the individuals coming through the system, right, hopefully get the fair shake in the trial to begin with. If a conviction occurs and then there is a claim of innocence, they're also going to get a better shake in terms of, of a fair exoneration evaluation process. The second component I think that's worth, worth articulating is this, I think there's a, there's a disconnect because the forces that require in our adversarial criminal justice system to result in a conviction are an antithesis of the, in, of the innocent investigation that you do on a regular basis. Right. It's not, it, it's not, in, in some respects, some might say that the tables are reversed, but you're the defense person now because you're defending, your office is defending that conviction and the defense counsel, but we shouldn't call them defense counsel or prosecutor, we should call them innocent inquirers, right? I, I like what uh, the prosecutor in St. Louis called it. She said, we're ministers of justice right. when we deal with innocent claims. And it's that changing of that mindset. And I think, I think courts need to look at, and, and I'm glad the, Sentencing Commission 
uh, organization that's hosting this is because they think we have to look at how can we improve the process so that integrity of the process is, is uh, beyond suspect, that everyone is getting their fair shake by, by improving the process itself. How do we, how do we uh, achieve that? That's what we're doing in Ohio in terms of our task force, trying to figure out what's the best methods that are being used in your office, Valerie, or in Lindsay's office, or in Lisa's office, and how we can we cobble them together to create a mechanism by which we've created a process where the integrity is paramount and it's not dependent on the advocacy of an individual prosecutor who's forward thinking or progressive, however you want to characterize that individual. Uh, that's difficult, but that's what we're trying to accomplish here in Ohio. And I just, I, I'm really enjoying your, your, your engagement and it's great to, to hear how, because you're down in the trenches working within the existing system. I'm trying to figure out are the ways that we can modify the system to make the job easier so that that truth seeking isn't as hard or as long as it's taken in many instances. Absolutely, Judge. And I, I think the key to that though is what we've all talked about is changing the culture, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can bring in people into the prosecutor's offices and you can elect people in the prosecutor's offices and you can work with the police departments to change the culture, well, especially the police departments. I, I, I will say the thing that shocked me most coming from the defense over to here was the, the quality or lack thereof of the police investigations ranging from just not a good investigation. I, I don't know that you can point a finger at somebody to police officers who actually framed people for crimes they did not commit. I don't care how good of a prosecutor you are, probably in the moment, you could not have figured it out. And it takes, sometimes it takes the passage of time, unfortunately, to be mm -hmm. able to go back and see a clearer picture or see a pattern of certain police officers and the misconduct they engaged in to figure out what was, what was going on. But I think, I, I don't think, I have never met a, anyone who goes into prosecution who says, I'm gonna go do this to convict innocent people. I mean, I think people come in with the right mindset, but you get, you get busy and overwhelmed and overworked and stressed and um, jaded and whatever else happens, cynical, it all happens to people and you just start like getting chipped away at. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to- I'm going to jump in here, Judge, just to uh, step step off of what you were saying as far as what, what do you do? And to say that the minister, to be a minister of justice, that should apply to police officers, defense attorneys, prosecutors, mm -hmm. everyone in the system alike. It should, that should be the ultimate goal, whether we we're working for a different end, but that that's what how we, that's what should gauge our steps along the process. And what I what I feel is that from for whatever reason, our system, where it came from and how it evolved, has never evolved into the idea that it's justice. It's not a win, it's not a conviction. It, it's not about who takes the biggest paycheck home. What we need to do is educate. And the, the component that I see is missing in this along the way is the, the bench. Your, your judiciary body has so much power over what goes on in that courtroom. And I was, a def I was in the public defender's office for 18 years and then when I was the elected DA for eight years thereafter, and now I've done this. And I will tell you that the, the judge, some judges have control their courtroom completely, and I'm not saying they do it well, but the judiciary has such power over anti-integrity or disingenuous people, and they don't use it. And maybe we need to educate our, you know, the bench part of it about this isn't about putting people away. This is about doing the right thing. I don't know. That's my perspective from being in the well, I guess, behind. 
Well, I, I don't, that's, it, that's an interesting perspective because I've been a judge long enough that I, I hope I don't have those judicial blinders on. I don't think I do, quite frankly. But I, I, view, I view the role of judges, and maybe some judges don't like this view, is that all we can ultimately do as the court or as judges is to hopefully instill the integrity of the process. We set the table or the playing field as you'd like, all right? So that you advocates will come in and you will be given fair treatment. And if you're applying those same fair rules, we'll get a fair result. Isn't that what, I mean, that's really what the goal is of our process. So the issue really becomes what happens when some of the participants, and I'm not suggesting it's the lawyers, I'm not suggesting it's even the police, quite frankly. It could be a witness that ultimately ends up recanting, right? The conviction is based on a witness. That witness, for whatever reason, had motivations unknown to anyone. But ultimately, over time, it became clear that, you know, that witness was wrong. And therefore, justice wasn't served because an innocent person was convicted. Our system has a hard time coming to grips with that because the individual is like, we did everything right. We prosecuted this complying with the rules of engagement and a conviction occurred. And, as, and if the court imposes those rules fairly, that conviction occurred, all right? We live in a system where status quo and the end of that case, all right, provides some level of peace to know we're moving on. And so these wrongful convictions really disrupt that tremendously, which is why I like talking about it being the process itself and an innocence inquiry versus a, a continuation of a post-conviction manner of that adversarial proceeding. Because I think if we can divorce or separate the two to recognize the distinction, it becomes clearer in my mind that we're not, your, your advocacy and the defense counsel's advocacy shouldn't be at odds, but rather should be joined. And this gets into what John has tried and opined about it, you know, in, in his writings about how you view these going forward, whether it is truly adversarial or should be innocent with, with no culpability. It's just, let's all seek the truth in that innocent process. Well, and to, to be clear, I mean, I think, and, and Lindsay, I do definitely wanna hear your thoughts on this. You know, I think one of the things that conviction integrity units do very effectively, the good units do very effectively is they do review these cases. They do try to right past wrongs. The opportunity for every single one of Lindsay's, you know, 10 exonerations, Valerie's uh, 30, and I don't mean to personalize these, right, the organization's uh, exonerations, every one of those is an opportunity for learning and understanding where the checks and balances that are there to prevent a wrongful conviction didn't operate. And so there are opportunities for police to understand how the wrong person was arrested, for prosecutors to understand how they could screen that case and accept it and charge it and prosecutor and believe it was righteous for the defense attorneys and the defense bar to understand why they weren't able to prevent it and and for judges to understand how their actions may have facilitated an environment in which we didn't get to the truth and and the first part of that the investigation part and the remedy part I think we're getting better and better at that learning process should be a separate conversation that we have with all of the participants and I haven't seen a conviction integrity unit that does that as a matter of course yet Obviously, resource constraints are what they are. But um, so with that, with now I'll get off my soapbox. And 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 Lindsay, let's let's go to you and let me ask what you do to build that credibility. Um, if the if the cookie integrity unit is working, that's great. But maybe there are other things that you do as well. Yeah, sure. I can't bake at all, so cookies are not uh, in my wheelhouse, <laughs> and that's not happening. That's that's not what I do. Um, so many thoughts right now. But just to go back to that original question, so. What you have to remember about the commission is when we were created, we came out of a study commission, much like what Judge Zamuda is doing now. Um, there, they brought together all of these different people from all over the criminal justice system to talk about uh, the causes of wrongful convictions and what remedies we might have in North Carolina. And so what they realized then was that the, the motion for appropriate relief system that we had was not really uh, addressing innocence claims. Judges didn't have time. Uh, when they came across their desk to really delve into them and no one was putting the resources into those. And so the commission was created. Part of that involved a whole lot of compromise, right? All these different groups had different ideas about what this would look like. And that's why you see some of the kind of constraints on the commission's 
um, ability to look at cases. That's why we only look at felony cases. That's why we only look at actual innocence. Um, and those are all really good um, compromises that were made. Another compromise that was made was that the convicted person at some point in our process would have to waive all of their uh, privileges, um, the right against self-incrimination. They have to answer every question that we ask, those kinds of things. They had to give up that attorney-client privilege from the uh, first or from their trial attorneys and their appellate attorneys so that we can access that information. Because again, we're only looking at factual innocence. So we have to be able to ask those questions you know, did this person ever admit guilt to you? That kind of thing. So through all of that, I think that compromise system already laid a foundation in North Carolina for some trust of the Innocence Commission process. We're also independent and neutral. We're not tied to a prosecutor's office. And I think that that helps in part um, with some of the skepticism from the defense community. The other piece to this is really just education. I spend a, an incredible amount of my time um, on outreach and education, whether it is talking to district attorneys or clerks or going to the chiefs of police conferences and trying to communicate with as many chiefs in the state that I can or the sheriff's association, um, all defense bars, all of those different, uh, what we call criminal justice partners, um, and really educating them about who the commission is and what our mission is. Talking to them about the fact that, hey, you know, we're not just looking for innocent people, we're also confirming guilt. And our statute requires us, if in the course of an investigation, we uncover evidence of another crime or wrongdoing um, or misconduct, whether it's on the part of the convicted person, the prosecutor, law enforcement, or some third party, we're required to turn that over to the appropriate authorities. So for example, uh, we were out one day um, and could, we're trying to locate a witness who had absconded from probation. When we located him, we called probation and said, hey, this is where he's at. So that is a way that we build that um, trust with those different partners. Um, and that's just kind of a function of the statutory scheme that we're under. So Lisa, understanding that you've been uh, conviction integrity unit by remote uh, connection for the past you know year as you're getting started, um, how are you being received in various counties? Have you had cases where a jurisdiction says, "Thanks for the heads up, we'll take it from here"? Are you know do counties welcome the the resources? You know, does that vary? Like how how do you how do you do your outreach in that regard? From the beginning, um, as a, a elected DA, I was a member of the board of directors for the statewide DAs association. So I had a voice with the elected and and you know the managing organization statewide. So when I uh, lost the election and then got appointed to this position, I, the mission in the beginning was for me to talk to as many. Uh, leaders in the organization as I could to try to explain what what we saw this unit um, becoming. And it, it was amazing to me in the beginning to see how much pushback there was. But once we, as Lindsay said, once you start to educate them and say, look, we're not here to tap on your shoulder and say you made a mistake. We're here so that we can do the right thing and correct an injustice with the resources that aren't available to a lot of um, the local jurisdictions. So remotely, what I do is we developed a, an agreement between the DA's association, uh, how we handle cases, what the process will look like. It's very fluid though, because no case is ever the same. But as we develop that agreement, you, know, you can see the attitudes beginning to change. And, and what, what I'm doing now is I contact the office and I haven't had one local jurisdiction say, no, we're not, we're not gonna provide access to a file, even before I would make a decision as to whether we're gonna further investigate. You can't make that decision until you have the information and access to the files. So it, it's been developing over the last 12 months into something that's very workable. Uh, collaborative and the attitude is changing 
that this is what we all should be doing together. Um, but I still feel that there's a lot of education that education upfront is what I think needs to happen. And John, I'd like to just go back in and add on to something that you said as well. So learning, I think the piece about educating, not just about what we're doing, but about the lessons learned um, to the different groups is really important. And I'm hopeful that we're actually um, partnering with one of our commissioners um, in the coming months to write a law review article about just that, about some of the things that we've learned and how those can be applied to hopefully prevent these wrongful convictions on the front end um, so that people can really be thinking about all of these different things that go into play. And do you, do you think, you know, I think this education component is, is a key as well, because the education is just because you're a criminal defense lawyer or your prosecutor doesn't mean that you have the tools or the education that really allows this inquiry relative to the to, on wrongful convictions, because it's a different analysis, a different process, because you're taken out, as I said before, you're taken out of that advocacy and, and therefore to build within your respective systems some educational requirements so that for those that are representing individuals that are petitioning because they believe they've been wrongly convicted, that they understand it's not just because I do criminal criminal work that I'm qualified to do this kind of work. And I think Valerie, maybe you're the best example on the other end is that just because you're a prosecutor doesn't mean that, that you can look objectively from the prosecutor's perspective on these petitions of wrongful conviction, because I think it is a different mindset. And how do we create that, that's what I like to look at. How do we create tools or educational opportunities to recognize it's a different set of factors, different set of mechanisms, I think, to do it effectively and properly. And if, you, if we can find them, I think you build that cooperative you know, uh, rapport that you're looking to improve the, the efficiency of the system. Yeah, I think what, what we see here, judges, you know, obviously both Valerie and, and Lisa, um, Lindsay, you, you may as well have both prosecutorial and defense expertise, right? And so the ability to do what all of us as advocates, I think, should do anyway, which is to understand the weaknesses in our case and be able to look at it from the other side, you know, but, but that's that both of those expertises are, are there and very pronounced. And that's a very useful thing to have um, in your uh, in your CIU is to make sure that you have that capacity. The other thing that we saw when we did our survey of units was that units where the, the CIU was separate from the appellate unit uh, and reported directly to the, the head of the jurisdiction, the elected, you know, that does two things. The first is when you report directly to the elected, you send a very strong signal about what the elected believes and you eliminate opportunities for other or other, other supervisors or leaders who might not buy into the mission to hoard resources or deprive it of oxygen, right? So, so that's one good sort of cultural structural thing. When you remove it from an appellate unit though, I mean, the, the appellate unit is geared almost by definition to preserve convictions, to argue the procedures that this was a fair process. There is no reason to look at this. And that's not being critical of them in any way. Like that's the structure and the, and the design of, of that unit. This is a different process, right? What we're saying is we're not looking at the procedures necessarily. What we're looking at, the procedures might explain why we got it wrong. We're trying to figure out, did we get it wrong? Right. right. And and so the question, did we get it wrong, is a different question than were our procedures run the way they were supposed to run. And when you remove the unit from the appellate organization, you allow more easily for that shift in thinking that you're describing to happen and be consistent. Uh, and so those are sort of two things that, that we've seen structurally. And I think they're reflected in all of, well, Lindsay's obviously got, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact the word neutral is in your, you know, in your mission and on your website. I, I I kind of go back and forth on that because hope you know I, I, I and we can get at that in a second. But but certainly with Valerie and Lisa, right? That that distinction is uh, is made clear in those in those ways. So, so John, if it was done, the okay, yeah, go ahead, Valerie. There's a lot of uh, no, it's all right. You go ahead, Lisa. I, there's a, I didn't know what the feedback was. You go. Nope. I'll defer. I'll defer to you. I'm the I moderator. Lisa, go. <laughs> I, I, I was just going to go back to the idea that, I mean, if we all are going to keep talking about ministers of justice, it, I have such a problem with the 
the idea that the appeal unit is working, it, they are, they're defending the conviction, but when they recognize, and they do, because I've had the conversations with the appellate attorneys who have been defending a conviction through PCRAs for 12 years, and they know something's wrong. That, that's the part of the education that I think we have to insert there and say, okay, why are we defending something so rigorously that you know is wrong? That's where the thinking has to start to change. And then we can all be out of jobs retire right <laughs> well, that, yeah great point go ahead valerie so lisa and i are on exactly the same page and that that is an when you talk about education um i like uh lindsay and i'm sure lisa once she gets out of her house uh would do the same but i i, I speak at any, anyone who asks me to speak I, I i speak it doesn't matter if it's a community event a lawyer event a prosecutor's conference if, if you ask me to be there i will be there um, I think it's really a critical part of our mission and we need to spend time educating people, talking about what we do, how we do it, so they understand, because that is a critical, to Judge Muda's point, a critical part is the education. And so people can understand the causes of wrongful conviction, how is a defense attorney or how is a prosecutor or how is a police officer, can I do my job better so that this doesn't happen? Um, and the other part is I couldn't agree with Lisa more. I, it was exactly what I was going to say. I have put a lot of time and effort into um, uh, oh, working. I, I don't want to say I'm working with appeals because they're a separate division, right? But working on the concept that we shouldn't fight cases just because we can, that we need to look at what we're doing and, and have some rationality in there. So for example, and I think things are changing, but I think, again, it takes time. Our very first case was a gentleman who had been in prison. My very first CIU case was a gentleman who had been in prison for almost 50 years. The, there was a trial court motion. The judge had granted a new trial. And the, and the appellate division was appealing the grant of a new trial. There was a lot of evidence of innocence. And they were appealing on the legal issue that the evidence of innocence was not admit, would not be admissible if there was a retrial. So, okay, that's fair on an appellate level, you know, to make that argument, but why would you make that argument? You're, you're making an argument that evidence of innocence couldn't have come in, so therefore he shouldn't get a new trial instead of looking at the fact that it's evidence of innocence. Like this is a man who's been incarcerated for almost 50 years and you're gonna continue to, first of all, even if he did the crime, that hasn't he done enough time, uh, you know, just from a pragmatic perspective, but from a realistic perspective. So I, 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 I agree so strongly with Lisa that we have to work on um, the appellate divisions and, 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 and then that I think will work its way down much more effectively into the rest of the office if appeals divisions are saying, you know, going to talk to a trial attorney and say, you know, we lost this because of this and we're not gonna take it up to the Michigan Supreme Court because we are ministers of justice and it's just not the right thing to do. And so I think that's how you can really permeate the message in addition to, for example, I just gave an ethics talk to all of the new incoming uh, lawyers in the in the training, and so I think if you if you can get your training directors to put CIU front and center in training mm -hmm. inside the office, that helps tremendously. And I'm also a big advocate, although I will admit I have not accomplished it yet in this office, um, that the CIU should be the ethical officer, the director of the CIU should be the ethical officer for the office, should be designated as the ethics wing of the office um, for a variety of reasons that we don't need to talk. But I think all of those things, you know, start changing the culture and, and, and presenting a culture that fairness matters, justice matters. You know, you see an email where someone congratulates somebody you know, for convicting somebody, you know, 
you know, I push back on that because if you're a minister of justice, whether the jury says guilty or not guilty, justice has been achieved, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to get away from celebrating a conviction and crying over a not guilty verdict because it's all justice. And you do the best you can with what you got. And, and if you don't get a conviction, if you get too personally invested, that's where things go wrong. So that's it. So, so Lindsay, um, you know, as you said, you operate within a statute, right? The, the authority that you have is statutorily driven. And so you're in a little bit of a different position than an elected who might have policy uh, opportunities. So how does your office function then with the statute that provides some of those same limitations that an appellate division might uh, put on things? This idea that, you know, if the evidence could have been reasonably, you know, used at trial, right? So it's not just was used, as I understand the way you describe the statute, it's also could have been used. Um, does that, you know, how does that impact your work and your ability to, to, to kind of look at innocence as the key? Sure. So it is by statute, it is if there was a trial, um, if it was presented, then it's not new. So if someone didn't present it for whatever reason, then it could be considered new. And it's if there was a plea, if it was reasonably available at the time of plea, then it's not new. Reasonably available is um, something that is really in the discretion of the director to decide, um, you know, was that reasonably available? any kind of forensic testing, we're gonna, we're gonna say that can be new, right? Um, just because someone didn't do it then, you know, forensic testing is changing all the time. And so if, if it wasn't done, then it's, it wasn't reasonably available to the convicted person. The rest of that really is just discretionary. And the statute is very clear about the director's discretion um, and how much leeway there is there. So that gives me the opportunity to make sure that we are really investigating every avenue that we can. Um, and we try not to foreclose things just off the, the gate uh, or out the gate um, without really thinking about whether or not they can be considered new. It, well, it, so that's very helpful and, and interesting. And you raise another really interesting point, which is I, I personally have never understood why we would have a fight about whether or not to test uh, material that is available for testing. Um, I, you know, as particularly if the petitioner is willing to pay for that expense, right? I, I, I guess I could see in some, in some instances somebody saying, well, it's expensive and not probative. But if the, if the petitioner is willing to take on that expense and they have an otherwise colorable claim, right? The, the, to, so to say forensic information is always sort of defined as new evidence is a way of addressing that point, right? Because it, it just strikes me as a tough, a tough spot to be in to say, oh, we want actual innocence, but no, we're not going to let you test that. Yeah, and so that is kind of, again, unique to the commission because there are um, post-conviction remedies that a convicted person can seek outside the commission process in North Carolina for um, DNA testing, but there are some specific um, elements of that statute and requirement that make it sometimes difficult to get a court to grant that motion, whereas if they're willing to come through the commission process, they don't have to meet any of those hurdles. Um, if in my discretion, I believe that the items should be tested, then we're gonna test it. And so, and we do, we err on the side of testing. We may set up a testing um, progression. So we may test the most probative evidence first and then move on um, through other items um, that would be less probative, but that, you know, assuming that the most probative item doesn't confirm guilt, uh, we would still need to test those other items. We might move kind of through a progression to save money but we're always gonna err on the side of, uh, of testing and we're always going to consider any kind of forensic testing to be new evidence. But oftentimes, John, aren't there, I think the state's statutes preclude testing uh, uh, unless it's um, specifically um, related to the, the, the petitioner themselves, I think. And certainly that's what happens in Ohio. I'm not sure if that's the same law in Va at Valerie in Michigan. If, if the statute that allows that subsequent DNA testing has to be related to the petitioner versus some third party unrelated, or at least I don't know if that, that's what the law is in Pennsylvania. But I think it's a good example of you building it on top of existing criminal structure, right? That dealt with the conviction of, an, of, a, of a person. And this, is it related to that person therefore they would have standing versus not to, our, to try and argue, well, wait, we want this tested. 
And I think it, it, it's another example of that conflict because it, it's no longer the conviction process, it's the innocent project process. Yeah, and, and certainly, Judge, you're hitting on a really important thing, which is each jurisdiction has these different rules, right? And we are seeing the case, you know, this high profile case in Missouri that has gone up to the Missouri Supreme Court yeah. where everybody basically agrees that this person is innocent, but they, the court is basically saying there is no claim right. to deal with that. Now, in that way, conviction integrity units have a really valuable uh, role to play because, you know, if you look at Texas, they've added an actual innocence cause of action to their habeas law because they realized that the prosecutors didn't have that ability. In, in Florida, when I was talking to Melissa Nelson, the elected in Jacksonville, and she was starting the first Florida uh, in to conviction integrity unit, one of their challenges was there was no ability to toll the post-conviction appellate process. So an, a, a CIU investigation would be going in parallel with a moving appellate investigation and that appellate investigation might have an influence on the ability to seek, you know, factual innocence right. because you might have deadlines, exogenous deadlines that, that, that get in the way. And so each jurisdiction has uh, different challenges like the ones that, that you're citing. And I think that, you know, Lisa, Valerie, Lindsay are in a position to be able to go back and say, hey, this is why we're having a problem. These are the, 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 the logical loopholes and gaps that are created by our appellate system. And then, and then they're in a great position uh, being part of kind of the, the, the government and law enforcement infrastructure to some extent to then advocate for that change in a way that is supportive and not viewed as you know, problematic politically. Like hopefully, hopefully we're all nonpartisan in our roles with conviction integrity, right? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, some, of us, some of us have taken the oath of that, right? Justice is blind. Lady Justice, she wears a blindfold for a reason. That's right. Um, I'm sorry, Lisa and then Valerie. I, I, I just had a conversation this morning with a defense attorney that's in habeas uh, litigation right now where the local jurisdiction would not agree to DNA testing. And my opinion is this, if the person, if the applicant has the funds or a benefactor that's going to pay, there is no reason that that testing should not take place. And if, if the prosecutor's office is saying no and they're pushing back, then that's a red flag. So we have a lot of, which rolls into a lot of, uh, there's a lot of push right now for amending our post-conviction statute. Uh, we have a, a, a tremendous group uh, that's talking to the, the legislature and it could be a quick fix. Do I think it will happen? No, but it could be very similar to what, Lindsay and Valerie, you may agree with this or not. It seems that you almost have the perfect perfect environment for in vetting and investigating these cases because you don't have to answer to anyone. I mean, other than your commission, you're, you're not dealing with a local prosecutor. Uh, <clears throat> there's to you, Val. And no, I think statewide AGs have a whole host of very specific hurdles uh, that nobody else has. And it, it, you know, dealing with all the different prosecutors is definitely a situation that's unique only to a statewide AG's office. So I, I, I commend you because it's, it's a lot of different personalities to deal with to try, to try and get things done. I can tell you in, in, in Wayne County, uh, we have a DNA, the Bloodsworth Grant. Uh, we partner with the Cooley uh, Law School Innocence Project. And my answer to them is the same in every single case. They don't even ask it, or they ask if they want to laugh at me. Um, I'm like, whatever you want to do, we're going to do it. That's it. Don't, don't even ask me. You, you want to do it? You think it's probative? We're going to do it. Why would I say no? Um, it, it, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. And so I, I agree. I think um, that is, goes back to everything we've been talking about, about the culture of the prosecutor's office, right? Why would you ever say no to testing a piece of evidence that could be probative of someone's innocent and, like Lindsay said, the other flips out of that, of their guilt? I mean, usually testing is definitive. It, you're, it either doesn't match and it's probative of innocence 
or it does, and you can confirm that, hey, we got the right guy and, you know, or right gal. Um, and then, you know, you don't have any questions about that case. So no matter which side you fall on, I think, you know, testing is necessary and, and, and nobody should be fighting it. And I agree with uh, what Lisa said. I do think the commission model is, is a good model in that we are independent. And so it doesn't matter if the prosecutor doesn't want us to look into a case, we're able to look into the case. Part of that is relationship building, right? And we work really hard to do that. But at the end of the day, if the case meets the criteria, then we're gonna look into it. Um, and so I think that that is, that keeps us from being kind of our hands tied as to what cases we look into. And that, that can be really important in getting to the truth. So let me circle back, um, Valerie, to something that, that you talked about, because I, I, I'm intrigued by it. And it, it, it may be um, an area that, I, that you know, I haven't thought all the way through. One of the things that we um, suggested in our report in 2016 was given the challenges with um, building these connections that the three of you and, and Judge Mood also have talked about building, that we would separate uh, disciplinary matters from conviction integrity matters. So if in the course of reviewing a case, you were to find uh, Brady issues, whether they're police driven or, or within the office, our suggestion was, hey, the conviction integrity unit has enough problems trying to build credibility without also being internal affairs. So, so if those things are discovered, the ethical obligation is the same as it would be for any other attorney in the office to turn it over to whatever that review process, accountability disciplinary process is. Um, and if it's Brady, if it's Giglio, if it's whatever on the police side to turn that over in, in that route as well. When you mention having the, the, the head of the unit become the ethics officer, does that conflate those roles and would that complicate things for the, for the unit? I think it could, absolutely. Um, so from my perspective, if we found prosecutorial misconduct that needed to be reported to the, you know, needed to be reported to a grievance administrator, um, you know, I, you know, we haven't yet. So I, I don't know that I've thought this through either, John. So maybe I'm thinking of something, uh, maybe it's not a great idea because I'm thinking I, my rationale is more for the office to set the CIU up as, right the ethical uh, center of the office. Certainly if we investigate, investigate a case and we find an ethical violation, I would have a duty just as a lawyer right. to, to, to report that to the grievance mm -hmm. administrator. So um, I think that's a potential problem um, that we would have to work out. Like would there be a separate person that if we find prosecutorial misconduct, then maybe it would go to the public integrity unit. We have one in this office. We're large enough that we have one. I know many offices don't have a separate <clears throat> public integrity unit, but it seems to me that if it was a more formal, like the office wanted to do further investigation, it should go into the hands of somebody else. So I would treat it the same way we treat police misconduct. If we find police misconduct, I report it to the chief of, if it's a smaller agency, I report it to the chief of police. Um, and if it's the Detroit Police Department or a department with, you know, a big internal affairs department, I report it to the head of the internal affairs department. And then they do whatever they want to do with it. And we cooperate with them. We turn over our documents. Um, we'll sit down with them. We'll walk them through the case, what we find, what we found, why we think it's misconduct. Um, bring along supporting documentation to make it easier for them. And so, and, but, but it's not our investigation, it's someone else's investigation. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, I, th I think that's very clear, thank you. Um, so the, uh, let, me, let me ask this question of, of the three of you, uh, and I, I guess I'll start with, with Lindsay on this one. So one of the really interesting questions that we've engaged with with a lot of units is um, what data they should be tracking, right? What information should be conveyed about the work of the unit? Because there's a risk that people think, well, if I've got 30 exonerations, I must be a good unit. And if I've got one exoneration or no exonerations, it must not be a good unit. Um, and that, you know, may be the case, but I, I, I personally would say exonerations are a useful, but not a dispositive metric of, of, of doing it right, if you will. 
Um, but Lindsay, you again have some legislative responsibilities and publish an annual report. Can you, can you talk to us about what's in that report and how you use that report to uh, improve over time? Sure. Um, it includes lots of things. I mean, everything from basic statistics, like you said, we want to let uh, our General Assembly know how many claims on average um, we're getting each year and how many we had in the year before, um, how many exonerations or hearings that we've had in a year. Um, all of those things help us um, justify asking for additional funding. But another thing that I track is you know, how last year, I wanted to know how many overtime hours and how many hours did we have um, interns or pro bono students working on projects for us. And it turned out to be almost three full-time positions worth. And so that is just part of that statutory duty of reporting that allowed me to then go to the General Assembly this year and request three additional positions. Um, we don't know if we'll get them yet, but knock on wood. Um, but so any kind of data like that that you can track to justify um, the money that you need, the resources that you need. I think it's important to um, track, you know, the why. Why are we closing cases? What types of cases are we seeing come into the office? Um, we also track things um, like gender. Um, we do have statistics on um, race, although we don't, as a neutral agency, we don't opine about those. That data is available so that other people can opine. Um, so all of those types of things, generally speaking, though, the, the, the items that I'm reporting to the General Assembly are um, intended to show the work that the Commission has done over the last year, show what we've done since the, our creation, which we've now been, um, we were created 15 years ago, so now we're showing, okay, what have we done over the life of this agency, and then utilize the information that we're tracking to request additional funds or positions. And so um, Valerie and, and Lisa, obviously, you know, look, 1800 petitions in three years, uh, that's no joke. Um, you know, it, 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 do you have a capacity to generate those reports? Uh, are there other, other, other data that you would be interested in following or that you do report? Uh, you know, curious to see how you're approaching this issue as well. So I produce an annual report every year. It's not a public document, it's an internal document, but um, it tracks everything that Lindsay said, and it also tracks uh, cases that have come in uh, by most serious crime convicted of. And uh, I, I track a whole bunch of other stuff as well. But currently, uh, one, one thing I found surprising when I came into this world of conviction integrity units was the lack of data and the lack of collection of data uh, across units. And so, I was uh, very extremely fortunate to fall into a one year where a specific grant was available, um, which is just was available that one time, but I got in there and, and, and received it and I'm working with the Urban Institute and now NORC um, to develop a, data, a, a pretty comprehensive database from my CIU that I hope will then be able to be rolled out to other CIUs at a significantly lower cost because I developed everything and we, we've spent two years on development to track a lot of data. So we want to track, we talked, we've talked a lot in this conversation about how to make the system better. How do we avoid the mistakes? How do we not convict innocent people? Well, one of those ways is really ramping up people's knowledge of what causes wrongful convictions. So I want to track in my database the, the primary causes of wrongful conviction. So were jailhouse informants involved in this case? Mm -hmm. Was there a false confession involved in this case? Was there bad forensics? If so, you know, delineate the types of bad forensics that, you know, that, that were involved. Um, you know, was there ineffective assistance of counsel? You know, was there police misconduct or, you know, now I guess the term is more official misconduct and then kind of breaking it out into police, prosecutor, judicial, you know, wherever it comes in, whatever kind of misconduct there is. And so that we, instead of just talking anecdotally when we give talks, that there will be this comprehensive database. And I can say, all right, we've had 30 exonerations. This is what we found. I mean, so, you know, misidentifying people. I mean, I have seen case after case after case after case where, you, you just say to yourself, why would anyone bring this case to trial? 
it's a it's a one witness stranger identification where someone saw someone for maybe seconds and and then they're prosecuted for first degree murder and sent to prison for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those are the types of cases I think if we can raise awareness to the prosecutor in the charging. So when they're char making those charging decisions, they can look at things more critically and say, oh no, wait a second, I, I'm not charging this case. And they can tell the police officers, you need to do more work because, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna deprive, potentially deprive someone of their liberty based on this stranger identification, cross-racial, whatever it might be. And so I think those are the ways by collecting that data, being able to show the interplay of things. And I also think that having a comprehensive database will help all of us as directors, because I think it will show us patterns that we don't necessarily see case mm -hmm. by case, mm -hmm. but by inputting all this information, patterns will emerge that will, that we haven't looked for necessarily. Um, and I do agree, despite the fact that I've exonerated in this unit, I think more people than most, um, I do agree that we should not track that as a way of saying, this is a, a good unit or a real unit versus this is not, because Michigan has a very favorable legal landscape for me to be able to move quickly. And so that is, you know, I, I don't wanna, diminish the work of my team. My, I have right. a great team and a deep bench, but we also have very favorable conditions in Michigan in terms of the way, the things that are available to us to, go, to get back into court. We don't have uh, procedural hurdles like in Missouri. We don't have anyone fighting us saying you don't have the power to do this. I mean, everything, and part of that is relationship building, right? I have a very good relationship with the bench here. And so, I think part of the reason we're so successful is we have a very conducive environment um, to, to, to being able to do this work. Thanks, Valerie. Um, Lisa, have you established a sort of report philosophy in the, in the short time you've been up and running? Uh, what I have found is <clears throat> what's most important, I think, as a statewide agency. I mean, the attorney general is the highest ranking law enforcement officer and thereby has a responsibility to identify jurisdictions where these trends may be surfacing. And that's the information I'm getting in these applications. You know, you hear it once and you hear it again and you hear it again. And that's the kind of tracking that data I think would be important for our agency to be able to collect at the end of the year so that we can implement not only a sort of a watchdog, but also best practices. Look, folks, this is what's happened in PA last year. This is why we need to address these particular issues. And I think the comprehensive data collection that, Valerie, you're soon going to get it to me right if it, this works this is an incredible tool for us not only on the implementation part for exonerations but also for the education part that I think is so important so that we can identify these trends that are happening to say, this is why it's happening this is what's causing it to happen and this is how we change it and fix it John I think if it's that answers your question that's, that's a good answer, John. I think it's important to, to also understand in Ohio, uh, we have a post-conviction statute that specifically requires the data collection of post-conviction proceedings with our sentencing commission. And yet there's no mechanism, there's no infrastructure, there's there's no ability, even though it's it's ordained in the statute, there's no ability to do that. So it's one thing to say we need to collect and everything everyone you know, data is the new DNA, as one prosecutor has recently told me, right? And I don't disagree with that. But the reality is data is one thing, but how does one collect it? Because we are, despite one criminal justice system, we are multifaceted. We're individual courts in individual counties, and in some instances, individual judges within those individual counties. Uh, and it really, and there's no, there's no unification of that. So, so as, as you try to collect the data is to create the transparency and the uniformity so that it's meaningful to the practitioners, it's meaningful to researchers like you, John, so you can study the systems and say, Lisa, you're doing really well in Pennsylvania. 
Valerie, not so well in Michigan or vice versa, whatever the case might be. And the only other thing I would say is I think the data collection piece, the proof of its success is, isn't is that illustrated what happened in Illinois and Chicago where the, where they started looking at the cases and then and then they found that that single co component, which is I think a um, one officer, is that right? One detective, I don't, and, and based on that, they were able to go back and then look at all of that individual's cases to, to essentially clear out a whole bunch of wrongly convicted cases because, because of that one individual, so. Yeah, and in fact, the, the Brooklyn Conviction Integrity Unit was created on that very basis. There was a homicide detective whose name kept coming up, kept coming up, and they started with a group of 150 cases from that officer. Philadelphia, I think, is seeing the same names kind of pop up, and both Brooklyn and Philadelphia, Philadelphia even just last week, released reports that are sort of longitudinal uh, in, that, in that way to sort of explain to people kind of, of, of the work that they're doing. So um, I want to keep my eye on the clock. We've got about five minutes left, so we've got a little bit of time for a, a bonus round, uh, quick answers. And I guess, you know, Judge, you know, look, this is, this is really something for an Ohio audience, so let me ask you what we haven't covered that you want to that you want to tap into in the in the now four minutes that we have remaining. Oh boy, in a bonus round, opportunities to create systemic improvements is what I'm looking for. And actually, this gets to what Lisa was was suggesting. She had just part, been participating with your with your um, Qualcomm Center. Quantrum. Uh, Quantrum. Yeah, I, I can never. Quantrum. Sorry. <clears throat> but but I think it's important because you know we can do piecemeal improvements. You know, uh, DNA testing, yes. And, but the question is, can we create an environment by which these are the, these are rules of engagement for which wrong convictions should be processed? So, uh, so thirty seconds or less. We'll start with Lindsay. What is the one systemic change you would like to advocate for to help your work go, you know, improve or or to, to create better, you know, justice in the system? That's a tough question. Um, I think you know, just the creation, continued creation, whether it's um, commissions like mine or um, conviction integrity units like Lisa and Valerie have um, that have some real teeth in them. I think that's really important, just getting people to buy into that. And I think the biggest way to get that buy-in um, is what we've seen here in North Carolina, and that is a bipartisan support for these changes. Nobody expected North Carolina to be the first and only of its kind to create a commission like ours based on the political landscape here. We had bipartisan support and we continue to have bipartisan support today. And that's really important. That's great. And, and I think, you know, you see that in Texas as well. When I tell people that Texas has an, an actual innocence ping, people look at me like I'm crazy. And I said, hey, look, if you've done it, they want you, they're, they're going to come after you. But if you haven't done it, right, then, then, then that's that. So Valerie, you're up. I think, uh, you know, the judges uh, can play a, a huge role in terms of systemic change. So the Supreme Court has control over court rules, right? So I think every Supreme Court, it would be nice if every Supreme Court across the country had a freestanding innocence claim uh, in the court rules and took away time limitations with the recognition that people often don't get the information that supports innocence in a timely fashion. So I, I'd start there, leadership from the top and, and bring it down. Awesome, Lisa? With that, there's really not much to add. I do think uh, statutorily and legislatively, we need a big change and it would help. Uh, and, and for me, Judge, I'm going back to my soapbox. I think, um, I think judges could also, as uh, agents to the court, could talk about doing event reviews, assembling the participants and doing event reviews and reporting back to the court on the structural challenges that contributed to uh, a wrongful conviction above and beyond people's intentional acts and making that, uh, what do we learn from this and, and forward looking accountability to improve the system, making that a, a routine part of what we do in conviction integrity could have real structural change. And perhaps add that then to the data collection piece because that, that, really that, that gives the story behind the actual statistics is what that does. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, and with that, we are right at 2.30. Uh, so I wanna thank uh, Lindsay, Valerie, Lisa, and you Judge Zamuda. I think this has been a fascinating conversation. I always love doing these because I learn a ton and this is true uh, once, once again. You guys do great work and you it's really hard work and you all do it really, really well. So thanks for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, and uh, Judge, I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody. Uh, we can be helpful to you or your audience uh, at any point, happy to do so. 
thank you very much. And thank all of you for your participation. It's been tremendous. Um, yeah, I just, and I welcome working with you in the future as we move forward, not only in Ohio, but all across the country um, to set up thank the right. Thank you for system. having us. Take yep. care, everybody. All right. Thank you, Judge. Thanks, John. Good job. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.